Welcome everyone to another episode of the Coaches and Content Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Scholl, and uh, today we got another great guest like we always do, but this guest is a little different because I've been a fan of this guy probably my whole adult life. He is an entrepreneur, content creator, professional wrestler, great guy. Uh, Stevie, what else are you? What am I missing? Uh, cat lover, beach bum, potential mayor somewhere in Florida, undisclosed location. I don't know, all the above. Regular gym owner guy that's afraid of people, that stuff. <laughs> that's right, guys. We have pro wrestler Stevie Richards. Make some noise for Stevie Richards. Um, so if you're a wrestling fan, you probably have seen Stevie. He's been in every major company from ECW, WCW, WWF, TNA. Um, and he had a great career and it launched him into his path now where he's a content creator. He's a podcaster. Um, he has his YouTube. What's your YouTube channel? Right now it's Stevie Richards videos. If you just search Stevie Richards, you'll see the, the, the more jacked up avatar uh, there and you can click on the, on the channel and subscribe. Yeah. So now Stevie has his channel where he, um, you know, produces content. He does reviews of gym equipment. Uh, he's a super fitness buff. He also has Stevie Richards fitness where, you know, with COVID and stuff, a lot of people were working out from home. Um, so he'll teach you how to get in shape and work out from home with the resistance bands. Um, and what is it? Stevie Richards fitness.com. Yes, correct. So guys, Stevie's a, an entrepreneur, um, and I'm super excited to have him on the show. He's gracious enough to do this, and he's reporting live from from uh, Florida. How's the weather in Florida? Oh, it's the same. Uh, you get out, you get out to the beach in the morning, and then in the afternoon it rains this time of year, which is always nice. I mean, I come from a place like with a lot of traffic where you didn't have a beach anywhere within six hours you had to drive six hours or more to get to one of these beaches so to be able to drive 10 to 15 minutes or maybe in a couple of weeks to be able to ride my e-bike to the beach uh it's going to be a really uh it's just a blessing all around to do that when you see me posting those pictures and videos on the beach where i say that i never get to, i'm still not like used to this and i can't get tired of this i i i mean it it's it's crazy so, you know, I'm, I'm from the Philly area. You grew up in Philly. Growing up, did you ever think you would live on a beach and live on Florida? Um, my dream was actually back in the day was to live like in uh, Cape May or the Villas. Like I, I, I liked Wildwood because of Attila's gym. Went there every summer with other wrestlers like Danny Doring, Roadkill, other people. That was our summer thing to go there for a week. But I would make trips from Philly to Attila's just because – I just love the gym, but Wildwood was way too fast paced and too many people at the time. Uh, Cape May, the villas, which is within Cape May. And then some of those smaller beach towns was what I always had an affinity for. And I also liked the Poconos. So Philly wasn't such a great, uh, a bad place to live. It was actually great, uh, you know, in some ways, because you're an hour from the mountains and an hour from the shore. So it was a good location. You know, I didn't even think to ask you about your fitness journey because, you know, I like to work out too and you're super into fitness. That's a lot of what your content's about now. But um, so even when you were a young kid, you were into the gym and stuff. Like, how did you get started with working out in fitness? No, I, I didn't know anything. And I, it's not like I never wanted to work out when I, got, when I got to a certain age, like 15, 16 years old, went to the local police athletic league. Since you're from Philly, you know what that is. Most people don't know what that is. Um, but I would go in there and kind of pay my dues with some of the older guys, the men that were lifting to try to get some knowledge and we'll learn how to work out and just be part of the group. And cause I never quite fit in. That's why I got into pro wrestling. Cause I, I was just some, uh, you know, like misfit toy in Philadelphia. And I went to the Island of misfit toys pro wrestling, but never really knew and never really dialed it in. And then, like towards the end of ECW is when I really started to kind of work out with the BWO stuff. I knew I had an opportunity, but I still didn't really know what I was doing. Then when I got to WWE or WWF at the time, I was watching guys in the gym and the way they train. I was like, this, this is like going from college to pro football for working out. I'm like, this is a whole new level of, and still years and years later, I went up to 262 with the right to censor. I lost the direction of my fitness journey as most people do it's a very much a big roller coaster ride through your life so i went all the way up to 262 
um, and then realized my job was probably on the line after the right sensor kind of went went away, got myself back into shape. And then that's when I became super obsessive the other way. And if I gained five pounds, I would freak out. So I, I went from being not accountable at all to be obsessively hyper accountable, which I, my wife claims I still am that way sometimes. Yeah. Well, you get up even to this day, you get up at like 4 a.m. and go to the gym, right? We get up at 3.30 actually. And some days like today, there's sometimes I get a, I just, I just get this motivation bug up my ass, as you would say in Philly, like I wake up at two and I'm just ready to go because I'm thinking about the things I need to get done for the day. Now people might be like, Oh my God, you, you're not one of those guys that these entrepreneurs, which I don't consider my, when I, when you're wearing an outfit, the total is $15. I, I don't really consider myself an entrepreneur, <laughs> but but the thing about that is like people hear that and they automatically think that we keep a sleep schedule like most people. I mean, we're getting ready for bed around 6.15, 6.30. We're winding down and maybe watching a little bit of TV after we get ready. And then it's kind of lights out by 8, 8.15 8 at the very, very latest, if not sooner. So we're keeping a sleep schedule that's still relatively healthy. I'm not doing this kind of stuff till 12 or one and then getting up at three 30, your, your body would not react well to that in a fitness sense. Yeah, actually I messaged you last night at like eight 30 and cause you know, so um, guys, that's just preference. You know, Stevie has a, a couple podcasts that he does about wrestling. Um, you, you guys do a review of raw WWE raw WWE SmackDown you do the Friday locker room. So I've been listening forever. So I kind of know like, you know, you go to bed early and stuff. So when I messaged you last night, I'm like, oh, I hope I didn't wake Stevie up. It's 830. I know he's probably sleeping by now. Well, I hit the do not disturb on the phone. It goes, it, 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 it's automatically at it. And by the way, I just I hate to correct you to your show, Zach, but uh, I do not have a wrestling podcast. I join two other friends and share their misery in watching five hours. I'm very much a co-host. I know my strength. I can never, I can never do what Vince do, does, and I can never do what Ben uh, does either. So I, I like going along for the ride and being like what Bing calls the C player where, you know, in Philly, there's always that guy that people are going back and forth, bip, 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 bip for whatever, yelling and screaming. And I'm that guy that just walks in and just says just one little thing and then gets the hell out of there. That's my, that's my role. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't watch the weekly shows. I just listen to you guys now. And honestly, your show is more entertaining than the weekly show. So it kind of works out. Well, thank you. I mean, I know you're new. You've been doing the podcast with coaches and content for like a couple months, right? Yeah. It just takes time. It takes showing up all the time, getting chemistry and always, always be willing to pivot. I, I think we talked a little off air before this, but like, I love doing all these different things, but I've realized from a business sense, although even though I love to kind of shed most of the wrestling stuff, it, it's impossible. And it's part of who I am and it shaped the things we're going to talk about in the show. So I, I do that with, with a business mindset. Well, I'm still doing it with two of my best friends. It, it makes it a lot easier. But your coaches and content show could take 10 or 15 different pivots, even in the next year. But, uh, but, but you're still trying to do different stuff. And I know you wanted to ask me about eventually about the YouTube channel that's that that one pivot I made from tech to fitness was like something that well we can get to it there was a lot involved with it and a lot of fear and a lot of comparison as the thief of joy type situations and once I shed those things and just did the thing it, it was the best move I could ever make yeah well why don't we just jump into it um so you know the show's about content creation and getting clients through content and you know, you were on TV, you were creating, you were on, in wrestling matches, you were in skits, skits and sketches. So you've been a content creator forever, basically. Um, but I know you made a shift after wrestling where you started your YouTube channel and you started, the first thing you started doing was reviewing tech, right? And doing tutorials for tech. Well, I started doing, actually, I was doing the YouTube channel in 2007. I was still with WWE. Oh, wow. Well, because in my, you know, famous last words i said well i'm on tv so it should be pretty easy to get a ton of followers and should be easy to get subscribers it should be easy to get partnerships with brands uh and all this other stuff same thing when i 
went to TNA in 2009 and I was still trying to get the tech stuff off the ground. I, I like to buck the trend a little bit, Zach, because I'm I, deep down, I am a pretty nerdy guy. I love technology. I love working with stuff and figuring out workflows. And I love creating stuff, not only content, but the fitness programs, the website. I like being the one man show because I don't think I can ever, I can't quite convey my vision to other people. If I had people working with me, I just rather learn how to do it and get it done. So that could be something you take with your, because no one's going to handle your baby quite as well as you. So that's why I took that. But, um, but think about that. And, and when we get to current state and, and I'll be very open about, you know, the affiliate relationships and my current state of my business, I, I it's, it's the weird, the way the world works, because you'd figure WWE person on TV or WWE superstar or wrestler or whatever you want to call it, still on TV with TNA, still relevant in ring of honor and still wrestling and still having uh, pretty much a full road schedule up until maybe 2014 or so, dude, I didn't get any traction on any part of what I wanted to do. My subscribers were not there. Nobody wanted to send me anything. I had to buy stuff from Best Buy and return it within, within the return window just to get content on tech stuff. That's where I got the idea of, up. To, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's a silly thing to do, buy it and then return it. Yeah, I eventually banned me and I had to go under my wife's phone number. But <laughs> but it's it's like that's where I got the idea about the updated reviews. And that's something didn't quite know where it was going to go. But I was like, I got this thing for 15 days. I need to shoot as much content. I need to shoot the unboxing, the full review, different kinds of topic related stuff just to get three or four videos out of this one product because nobody it's sending me stuff and I really don't want to spend the money. It's just expensive stuff. Um, but still no, no brands, no partnerships, no, no real subscribers to speak of. And this is as I'm trying to be a personal trainer in person on my off days within TNA. And then after that, uh, doing that grind, uh, not realizing that it was right in front of me, not realizing that, since 2002, working out resistance bands every day because I was always injured in WWE would come back a decade and a half later to say, hey, dummy, you can create a program and do that. You know what I mean? But if I didn't have that tech foundation, in other words, if I didn't take my lumps with tech reviews and learning how to shoot videos and then learning how to edit videos and still, like we said, off camera, trying to learn lighting and all this stuff, I wouldn't have, I'd have to hire somebody to film, to edit, to do these things, to, to work with audio, to build the website. I'd be the, like lazy and be like, I'll just pay somebody to do it. I probably save thousands of dollars a year by right off the bat, by not having anybody else do anything. Does that make sense? I, I mean, to me, it makes a million percent sense. And hopefully, you know, not everyone thinks like that. And that's why I love, you know, so, so guys, I, I also interviewed Stevie's co-host with named Ben Hameen. He was a couple episodes back, but I feel like all you guys are like that and you're very forward thinking um, because I'm on your YouTube page now. So now you have 80,000 subscribers and I sorted your videos by oldest and I see you have a video from 14 years ago. So YouTube started about 2005. Yeah, I'm, I'm 35. I feel really old saying that, but YouTube, I also Googled YouTube started 2005. So you said you started around 2007. So you mm -hmm. even back then you were ahead of the curve and you saw because I don't think most people who were using YouTube in 2007 had any thoughts about how to use it correctly. Like you were back then, you know, I, I wouldn't say I was using it correctly. In other words, uh, what well, you said, we're ahead of the curve. That can also be a bad thing because there's no money to be made. And you're kind of taking all the, you're working out like all the kinks for YouTube where I was podcasting, but you got to remember too, I was doing a tech podcast. I was doing it under my real name, trying to establish something outside of wrestling as well. Even though once people heard my voice or looked at me and are like, oh, we know who that is. But I was trying, I guess, for, for good intentions, I was trying to make my name outside of wrestling, which once again, we're 15, 14, 15 years later since I started the channel to try to make a name for myself. And people are finally saying, oh, that's the resistance band guy. That's the home gym guy or garage gym guy. That's how long it took patience and 
tons of failures and tons of no's and tons of um, tons of no ways too. We're never giving you stuff or never working with you, much less affiliate, you know, to get to that stage is, was like a mountain that I couldn't even think I could climb. Yeah. So you started with the tech stuff. Um, and you know, you eventually, you started your Stevie Richard fitness, which is basically a course you created with resistance bands that people can do at home. Um, but was there something in between that? Like, did you do something else after the tech stuff? Oh man. I, I mean, I was still wrestling. I was still, I was doing regular jobs too. And working in tech and working at gyms and doing whatever I could to make money. Because quite frankly, after WWE, um, and this is something else I didn't even know. I was released in 2008 at the time. I didn't realize the housing market was doing what it, what it's about to do right now. Yeah. Excuse me. In 2022, I didn't know we had a major recession. I didn't, you look at stuff. I didn't, I didn't have the conspiracy horseman type of hat on back then. I was just, I was just a JFK guy and maybe a 9-11 guy and looking at things critically. But outside of that, didn't have a ton of economic sense, didn't have a ton of business sense, a ton of business or economic awareness. So the reason why I say that is because I had money saved up and I had all these different things. And from 2008 up until I would say, God, maybe 2018, I tried to do everything. I tried to invest in different businesses for myself, pick up different skills, go to different little trade schools, do th- do whatever I could to find that next chapter, which I think in sports entertainment and, of course, wrestling, being sports entertainment, it's hard for you to move on from it and get another identity in the next chapter. And I feel like uh, on a bigger front, too, with content creation and, and people – who do what you do and do what all of us do, it's hard to shake stigmas and get past it and push past it and, and find success after that. And that's why you hear a lot of tragedies about wrestlers, about people in sports and entertainment, because it's just such a hard fall. I mean, it was easier for me because I was never for, for maybe a blip or two, I was featured in the top of shows in different companies. But other than that, I was always humbled whether I liked it or not each and every day. So I actually had an advantage to take the lumps of post wrestling business life. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you just have a good grasp on things in general, you know, just from listening and being a fan, it seems like you have a good ground, you know, you're very grounded and like, you don't, you're very, you're very grounded. I would say, you know, Hey, listen, I mean, I'd rather be that way. I mean, there's, there's something about ignorance being bliss too, but, and you can't fault the guys that are still making money today off of the eighties, nineties, or early 2000. If you're, if you can make money off of that, that's fine. But my personal belief and what I personally strive for is to always look forward and try to figure out what I can do next. I mean, I have the BWO stuff. Believe me, I fight, I fought my wife. Not literally, she would beat my ass, but I fought with my wife to not hang that up, to not do I was ready to throw the BWO stuff out. I was ready to like not not as a not as a ungrateful gesture or anything, but to leave the past completely behind. I'm a very absolute guy that way. But she hung it up in here and it looks good. But I don't look at that and long to put a pair of Daisy Dukes back, back on at all, you know, or any of that stuff. It's just a cool part of my life. And people who see it is like, okay, I, I get where you, you know, it's kind of like a piece of history up there, but the, but some people who put that up there, it's almost like, and you've seen people who've done those shows and stuff. I legitimately think they look like, look at that and they can't let it go. And that's, I, I very easily can let go of past stuff like that because that's nowhere near who I am. I mean, you're not the same guy that you were two months ago when you started this, how much have you learned from, doing the show yeah I've, I've learned a ton and i just learned a lot from the entrepreneurs and people that i'm interviewing yeah for sure yeah and you take everything you can and try to plug it into what you're doing and, you know it makes perfect sense and and that's something to where you could find the next you can find the mentor doing this show you could find the mentor that can give you the direction and everything you need to feel like that's what i always wanted to do and that's what i was trying to figure out and but i couldn't 
visualize it or verbalize it or do anything like that. And this person said, oh, this is what you got to do, Zach. Oh, geez, it's that easy. Because <laughs> they've made, like I have, 10,000 mistakes along the way and just gave you that to help you avoid maybe 7,000 of the 10,000 mistakes. Yeah. Well, so while you were wrestling, you know, because you, you kind of knew in the back of your mind it's not going to last forever. Like, you know, any wrestler is lucky to even get a small percentage of the success you've had or, you know, you've been in every, every major company. But did you kind of have in the back of your mind, like when did you start developing in the back of your mind, I need to have something else, a, a backup plan, or what's my next thing going to be? Like, did you have that at all? Uh, it's since the day I stepped into the business back in 91. Never, never for a second did I ever feel comfortable with any position I had in anything in wrestling. I mean, there was times where I was more excited, like an ECW, but WWE especially, I thought I was getting fired every week. And then in the environment designs that type of feeling or atmosphere in there. They think it keeps you sharp, but in a way it fosters way too much worry and negativity. And then I can lead to other demons coming out with certain people. Uh, with me, I thought that if I was proactive, I try to be as proactive as I can, except for doing yoga and things that help heal my body. I don't, I don't only do those when they hurt. So, but, uh, but being proactive, like I thought, Oh yeah, I got it all figured out. So if you're going to release me on August of 2008, which is when I was released day one, I'm, I'm off and running. I got these deals coming in and all this stuff it, it, figuring it out, you know, famous last words. Oh, I got it all figured out and planned. And I think I did have a plan and I think I did have a structure and a roadmap, but the best plans are, are never going to come to fruition because you have to rely on other people and other parameters to do that. And that's a lesson to be learned right there too, is when you're counting on other people and other things to happen. And hope is a very dangerous weapon that the wrestling business is based on weaponized hope. Think about it. But if you hope every day, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to plan to do this. I, I put up a thing on Instagram today. Like I said, a, a off camera that I always try to put up life is good. Is it a self-affirmation? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I believe it when I post it and I'm looking out at a beautiful ocean or I'm here where I've always wanted to be after trying to search for a home for 50 years, I finally feel like I have one. Um, now I look at it and it's just like, it's self-affirmation, but at the same time, people contact me all the time to tell me how their life isn't good. Like they spend the energy and the, and the time to tell me that their life sucks, but they aren't spending one solitary second trying to figure out how they can fix it or back up, to, to the core of it, whose fault is that? Like as a business person, you have to always say whether it is or isn't, it's my fault. It's my fault for letting myself, all right, even if you got taken advantage of in a business or somebody didn't hold up their end of the bargain, as a business person or entrepreneur or anything you're doing, you have to say, it's my fault for not seeing it or my fault for not having the awareness or my fault for letting it slipped through the cracks. My fault for picking the wrong business partner, the wrong employee. Now you have a now you have a way to act. The easy part is when you say, "Well, I'm not getting a push because uh, you know the guy who's probably is a scumbag." That's real easy, isn't it? Or you can say, "You know what? I'm not getting booked properly. I'm not getting pushed. I got a decision to make. Do I do I venture out on my own like a Zack Ryder did?" to re reinvent himself, which I'm proud of him for doing. That's the hard thing to do. Or do I turn around and do everything I can to look better than their top guys when I'm in the ring and make them look stupid. That was kind of my thought process. It gave me a little bit of control of my future. And it also instilled the work ethic that I don't care what this person does or that person does, or you don't, you have a guest no show always have a backup plan to do a one man show or make it a one man show and the guests are the bonus. That way you don't put undue pressure on yourself. Probably the hardest part for you. And I, I'm a, I have to apologize because I'm really hard to nail down. I told you, I'm like the Bill Murray of pro wrestling. I'm just moving target, yeah. but, but the, probably the biggest stress that you have is 
not even nailing, nailing down the guests is the second hardest. But then you hold your breath thinking, are they going to show up? That's like the, probably the most stressful part of your whole show, right? Yeah. yeah. Find, yeah kind of, finding them and making sure they show up is definitely the most stressful part. Yeah. Wrestlers are the worst. Trust me. I'm one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's what I mean. Now you have to examine it, Zach. You don't have to, but I feel like you should just for your own sanity. You have to examine your show and just say, okay, uh, do I have the next five people lined up? And then you got, do I have to have two backups in case or do I have to have a format for a one man show or do I use the roadcaster to kind of do theme shows? What do I do to not be inconsistent? Cause that's the second thing with content creation or any business brand. If you keep showing up once a week with your show or however many times you do it, people, it's the Jedi mind. It's the Jedi mind trick. It's my Philly accent coming through. It's a Jedi mind trick. If you keep saying, I, I'm the host of coaches and content, this is what I do. I'm the play. I'm helping coaches get clients through content. I'm helping coaches get clients through content. And then coaches keep hearing that. And you're like, hmm, this is the guy we need to produce a podcast so we can get more clients. Because he keeps saying it every week and he, he keeps showing up in our feed. He's got to be the one, right? And, and people will start believing in it. Not that you're doing anything, you're not working any less hard. The content's still going to be top notch. But if you keep showing up being that person, having the cool neon sign behind you that's custom made, all that stuff, it it all actually it all actually embodies your professionalism. And you talked about it off camera. Okay, I gotta get a better light. I gotta get a better setup. I gotta that's beautiful because you're not content with it. Yeah, man, you know, you and I are similar in a lot of ways. So you're like a kind of like an informal mentor to me in a way, because everything you just said, I feel and I'm trying to do. And to hear you say that to me really means a lot. And it means that I'm on the right track and I'm doing, you know, what I need to do, because I listen to you and Ben talk all the time. And a lot of stuff, I feel like it's stuff that I'm thinking or saying. So to hear you say it to me makes it even better. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can always reach out to me and also Ben, and we're we're happy to help anybody. With there's no secrets. Like I said, even the affiliate stuff, whenever towards the end of the show, or whenever you want to ask me, I, I I'm going to tell you what I do and what I try to do and my workflows and all this stuff and everything. It's not a secret. I like I like sharing that stuff, but that's the thing. You seem like a guy that would take that into action. Ninety five percent or more of the people. It just seems like a lot of work and it is, but it's beautiful because it's the only thing like there's so many things in life. That's why I love about fitness. Getting back to that thing. I love about fitness is it, it's the most honest. Um, it's the most honest gauge that you can have in this world, health and fitness. Cause if I tell you, Hey, I work out and I eat right and do all this stuff, but I'm 50 pounds overweight. What's your first thought? You don't eat right and work out. You don't do it. Right, right. It's you, you, the, the, the liars are quickly exposed. The people that are like, that's why like with my brand, my wife has been, you talk about mentors and feedback. My wife has been the one that has kept my compass in the right direction. She was the one that said when I was trying to do programs for power lifters, for bodybuilders, for these people, for moms and all this stuff. She goes, what's wrong with being the resistance band guy? And just working with beginners. That's all it took. And then that turned into the gateway program for people that then, want, then wanted to build a home or garage gym space. I did that unintentionally. I didn't realize it. I just wanted to have a cool home gym. But those people that use the band programs then say, man, I'd really like to, I feel, I feel good. I want to buy like a, a power rack or I want to buy an all-in-one trainer. Or I want to buy, now I want to buy a piece of cardio it, it, it fostered more business relationships and affiliate relationships with customers than I could ever imagine without even meaning to do it. Yeah. I love hearing the progression of things and how one thing leads to another, but we should definitely get into the fitness stuff. So with this, by the way, I had no idea this was progressing. This is only, this is only 20, this is 2020 hindsight, but, but I just kept showing up. Right. I was right. smart well, enough to know I didn't. Yeah. I was smart enough to know at my age that I didn't know anything about anything. And I just had to keep working hard to try. 
Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, uh, Stevie Richard Fitness, did you start that? It was a couple years before COVID, right? It was like 2017, 2018. I think it was, no, it was actually 2016. The first time we opened up the website was October 2nd, 2016. So you created a comprehensive at home workout at home program. That's for beginners or people rehabbing. And it's basically, it's a PDF. It's a bunch of uh, instructional videos. And you also sell the resistance band on your website. So it's a one-stop shop where people get the course, they get the videos, they get the documents. And they get the band, and then you teach them how to work out from home. Well, I I give them the tools, and what right. it is is basically it is a it is a workout program that basically I say it's twelve weeks or sixteen, but you can double up or triple up it. You can do the sixteen week for almost a year. So, but if you say forty eight workout forty eight week workout program, people aren't going to do it. They need to have a lower. It's a it's a weird business thing that I've read up on, but um. But with the programs, like I said, I was doing these resistance band programs through every injury in WWE. I was doing these resistance band programs when there weren't 24-hour gyms and I needed to work out in a hotel room before my flight. So basically, it's not even an at-home workout program. It's an anywhere workout program. I can go to the beach. I have a, I have a video up, a no-anchor workout video that we did up in the cabin in the mountains. And I'm actually going to do a beach version of that because... Hey, do you want to go to the mountains or you want to go to the beach? Like we talked about earlier. So I'm going to offer a couple different choices for customers out there. And I think the value besides the price and the support that I try to offer to everybody is also lifetime access. I had someone email me this morning. Hey, I bought the program a couple of years ago. They sent me a screenshot of their order number, sent them the link. Because and some people are like, well, that's stupid. You should, well, what, what do you want me to pick? Okay, this is why I asked somebody, like, why would you do that? If somebody emails you a year later or two years later, why would you do that? Why won't you tell them to buy it again? I said, first, the way I think is when they see that kind of value in, and not, not selflessness, but not, not greedy, not being greedy and trying to nickel and dime people and promise that promise to them this is a program you can do for the rest of your life. Therefore you have access to the digital download for the rest of your life. Um, I believe they're going to come back and buy something else. I'm going to have a program. They may use my Amazon affiliate thing. They may use one of the other affiliate links. They may tell a friend about the home gym stuff because I treated them the way they deserve to be treated. I gave them something they needed. And when they, if somebody emails me and says, Hey, listen, I, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting back into the program, but I got a new phone. It was on my phone from a couple of years ago. Um, can you send it again? This person wants to get back and reset their fitness journey and they want to use my product to do that. They paid for it. So who am I to make them jump through an extra hoop to, to get started? Cause if you have that extra hoop, you start to have doubts and say, ah, it's just a hassle. If I make it hassle free, what did I do to, for that person right there? Hopefully they got it and they worked out today because I sent it to them at like 2.45 a.m. when I woke up. <laughs> so, so with that being said, like, you know, I'm fostering return business. I'm not thinking of it that way. I think of it on a more personal caring level, but from a business level, I'm fostering repeat business from people that might just buy something just because, Hey, he was really cool to me. So I'm going to buy the next thing and hold on to that. So if I, if I want to graduate from the 12 to go to the 16, I'm ready to go. It's uh, I think people are really short-sighted with their business. And also let me ask you this question because I'll tell you about mine. Mine's easy. What's the mission statement of coaches and content? Like what, what's your, What's in your heart to say, what's my mission statement? What do I want to leave? God forbid, if I go and I leave this earth, what do I want to be remembered for with this brand? Um, this never happened before, but for, before I answer that, I need to grab my water real quick. I got something. Go like that, so let me grab that. Real quick. I'll keep talking. <laughs>